North American Seed Farm. Thank you. In uh, Junction, Texas. And uh, many, many of us uh, love the business, live by those catalogs and have uh, spent quite a bit of money purchasing seeds. So we're excited to have him join us tonight. He grew up in Sherman, Texas. Uh, his formative years were spent on his grandparents' property in Manshack. And this time outdoors with them on the land inspired him to learn all he could about stewardship. That's really where his, his uh, dedication to stewardship started. He first joined Native American Seed as an intern in 2002 while still in college. And five years later, was hired full-time after he graduated from Austin College with a bachelor's in environmental studies. At Native American Seeds, uh, he has done, led many prairie restorations, run the seed production on the farm, uh, harvest operations across many Texas eco regions. He loves figuring out the challenges of each new project and then sharing the new knowledge with his clients and others like us, Nip Sodders here tonight. So George, we're very happy to have you with us tonight and um, take it away. Thank you. Okay, so uh, over the last few years, we've gotten fairly competent at how to run the Zoom program, especially since we have uh, opened up a new facility in New Braunfels uh, where you can pick your seeds up and uh, hired some staff that work in San Antonio and DFW. So if I mess this up, I'm going to look bad. So uh, anyway, we're going to cover two topics tonight, and I'm going to zoom through these. I have uh, over 100 slides, and so I'll try and be judicious with the time, but it was requested that we cover... Uh, how to build native landscapes with seed, as well as how to collect seeds. So that, there's a lot we're going to go over. And uh, if I run long, y'all just tell me to move it along or just end it or whatever. But I'm going to, we're going to stop after the first show uh, and answer questions. And so if y'all would be so kind as to put those in the chat. Betsy said she would compile those if there were similar questions and uh, we'll answer those after the landscape uh, presentation and then uh, we'll move on to uh, collecting seed. And I'll probably zip through a little bit of that to try and get to the meat of that presentation. So let me go ahead and put this on uh, full screen. Okay. <clears throat> So that's me, I'm George, um, standing in one of my favorite places on earth. Uh, I guess it's a moment in time doing something that I really enjoy. Uh, I am just always fascinated by how powerful seeds are. And I realized that the audience is the Native Plant Society and uh, much of your work involves you know, plants and pots, uh, but it's always cool to think of where those plants came from. And so in, in our side of things over here, we have, you know, basically like a, a frozen moment in time and life uh, inside of a seed. And, you know, when you're working with so many different species and you, you learn about how they function in the environment and ecosystems, just always really impressive, like, you know, that each seed is hope for the future and for a better world. Uh, and they're just so small and tiny. There are some species we work with, like Texas bluebells, you know, that may have 15 to 20 million seeds in a pound. And that's just incredible to think about, especially when you're, uh, trying to do impactful work on the world, uh, you know, how much room would uh, 15 million four-inch pots of Texas bluebells take up? But you can fit that in the palm of your hand, you know. 
So anyway, that's a crop of milkweeds that we grew from seeds, and that's me taking pictures at sunset. Anyway, you can imagine that, uh, you know, we send out so many catalogs, and as our reach has grown over the last couple of decades, um, we get reoccurring questions here. Uh, and these are the ones that folks frequently ask. And I tell you, after doing you know, nothing but sales uh, before we hired our new folks. It was about three years solid of answering the telephone calls. And uh, for a guy like me that likes to be outside, it was kind of a tough ask. But, um, you know, I learn a lot from people I talk to and hope that I, uh, you know, teach them some things as well. But these are kind of like the most compiled, you know, frequently asked Comp, comp, compilation of questions that we get and after doing it for so long you know hearing the same questions over and over again I kind of came up with uh, a list of questions that I really wish folks would rather ask than the ones that they do so without question when's the best time to plant is what's asked and you know the there's so many answers to that question but it all kind of boils down to expectations uh, and we'll get into that a little bit. Which seeds to plant? How do I plant the seeds? How tall? How much seed? How much fertilizer? What kind of fertilizer? You know, when do we get flowers? I planted your three weeks, your seeds three weeks ago and nothing came up. Why didn't it look like the catalog? We planted your, your seeds a year ago and now I only got all these giant weeds. So I kind of flip the script here and and here's the questions that I really wish wish that the uh, folks that are reaching out to us were asking and I feel like if um, we did a better job of public outreach and education that these are the kinds of questions that people would ask when they're considering you know how do I be successful using seeds in a landscape so uh, I'll leave these up here for a minute. I tend to not like to do presentations with a lot of words and reading from a script or whatever. People go to sleep. <clears throat> but uh, the reason I, I, I always put this at the beginning is so that folks can begin to uh, see restoration projects in a, in a little bit different light. And you know, just because you're working on a 200-foot uh, square foot bed in your yard doesn't mean that you're not restoring the earth so don't let that kind of terminology you know think that this stuff doesn't apply to you so you can see uh that instead of like when's the best time to plant it's about preparedness and invasive species so especially in urban environments uh, invasive species are are like uh you know, really critical to deal with because they're so aggressive and seeds, especially of native plants, need time to do their thing. You know, oftentimes when we send things off to the lab for seed testing, they'll they'll germinate them for 28 days and they don't sprout, but then they'll do another test called a TZ test and that shows that the seeds are alive. So in some cases, uh, you know, you may have a seed in a pot for six months before it decides to sprout. So uh, same thing in a landscape. It may be six months. It might be six years, you know, so it's all about uh, having a window of opportunity for the native plants to grow in their time. And then there's there's other things about native plants, too, that uh, like white rosin weed, for example, Sylvia malviflorum, when you get that seed to sprout, you won't see a flower until the third year because it's developing a root system uh, in excess of 15 feet in the ground and it takes time, especially in the harsh climate in Texas for that kind of root system to develop. So, you know, uh, patience is a virtue and and uh, I think that's one reason why people are, um, you know, leery about working with seeds is they don't, uh, they don't have confidence in themselves for, for that period of time. Uh, and then the rest of this is all about uh, loving native plants to death. Uh, so overwatering and over fertilizing, you know, yeah, you think you're creating 
the optimal environment for these species, but it's not the case. They've evolved to deal with the harsh conditions that the Texas climate has. And so um, you know, oftentimes we wind up favoring invasive species over the, the ones that we want just because we're we're loving it to death. So main thing is, you know, do your expectations align with the reality? And, you know, it's human nature uh, that they don't. This is how I expect to spend uh, my summers or weekends. And the reality is always something less desirable. Uh, duty calls and uh, that's just how it is. So you get your pack of <clears throat> native trail mix from Native American seed and <clears throat> you want to go throw it out in September and then expect this to be what you see next spring and it's not always the case that that's what happens. So this this is if this is your expectation then there are some realities that need to be addressed before uh, those expectations can be met. <clears throat> so even here in this beautiful photo, right there in the center, you can see a big patch of uh, hedge parsley. And while a native plant's not exactly what you're expecting, <clears throat> I can assure you it didn't come from the DPAC uh, Native American seed, but that it was there existing in the soil already. And, and at this particular location, you know, perhaps the grounds crew didn't know the difference. And so there it is. Uh, so one set of expectations and one set of realities. So, you know, here, this is in Kimball County, uh, outside the Texas Tech Center. They, you know, redid the bridge over the river and uh, Textile was going to do a nice native landscape. And so here they, uh, their expectation was is that they could take this coarse uh, compost that wasn't even done uh, and lay it on top of uh, hard packed caliche, uh, provide no erosion control and seed buffalo grass in this median and everything was going to work out fine, you know. Obviously, the engineer hadn't spent a lot of time in Kimball County. Doesn't know how things work here. Uh, so, you know, every seed that they planted washed down that ditch <laughs> and into the river and on down the way. <clears throat> here they expected a, a nice coastal prairie, but instead they uh, did not treat the invasive Bermuda grass and Buffalo Bayou, among many other invasive grasses, and uh, applied a thick, thick cap of hydromulch and fertilizer, which allowed all the rhizome weedy grasses to, to take off. So another name for this presentation that we've put out there is uh, design for success. So these are design considerations that, that someone wasn't following the steps. So here you can see, you know, this thick cap of hydromulch on top of the uh, soil surface and then this rhizome Bermuda grass, which just takes off and there's still gonna be six weeks, six to 12 weeks uh, until the native prairie grasses will germinate. And in that time, this grass will have completely consumed the restoration project. So uh, they weren't planning ahead. Here's another great example. This is the San Antonio River, uh, the Mission Reach stretch, which we had worked on a pilot project up above this at the Blue Star and learned a lot about how challenging this environment was to restore because it's a basin in an urban area, completely surrounded by invasive plants. <clears throat> and uh, the techniques we developed weren't, you know, uh, adhered to in the next phase of this project. And so here their expectation was they could take this permanent TRM, I don't know if y'all can see my mouse or cursor, but that's what this is. TRM stands for turf reinforcement. And so, uh, you know, they, they excavated to widen the channel and applied these TRMs over the existing <clears throat> uh, native soil and then blew in a, a mixture of uh, compost and uh, seed 
and tried to use these baffles to hold it up there without providing any soil armor over the loose surface. Well, anyway, shortly after seeding, the river came up, you know, 10 feet and just totally wiped them out. So, you know, expectations and realities when, when those two things get out of whack, it uh, winds up in a failure. So there I am thinking, you know, how did we not help somebody not do this? So here's some steps for success. If you're planning a, a landscape or landscape restoration with seeds, you always want to find a good fit for natives because, uh, you know, they have totally different aesthetic and uh, functionality that, than, you know, traditional landscape plants. And uh, you want to be sure that if this is a public facing project that you've selected a, a site that's a very good fit. I won't like, you know, hang off the curb into somebody's door while they're trying to get out of their car, things like that. So, uh, and if you only have one site and it's, you know, maybe not, uh, ideal for natives, then you got to do a lot of work on the uh, the public outreach side. And I'll talk about that here in, in a little bit. But, uh, you know, read the land. So slope aspect, shade, existing vegetation, weed vectors. This is going to guide your species selection. So, you know, the example I always give is a north facing slope under an oak tree is a bad place to try and plant blue bonnets. But it's an excellent place to grow frost weed. So, you know, you just want to be sure to match the plants to uh, to to the habitat that you have. You know, vice versa would be a uh, the top of a a hill in uh, oh I don't know Dripping Springs or something. You know, and uh, you're gonna put cardinal flower out. You know, not a good idea. Even though that's a plant that's native to hill country, you always find it growing in the stream banks and and not up on top of the hills. So. Uh, same thing, you know, buffalo grass under an oak tree, not a good idea, you know, so you want to be sure to, to plan. And then, you know, assess the design, take a hard look, get some, get some, uh, another set of eyes on it and redesign if, if need be. Uh, preparation, so now you're preparing. So this is, you know, a critical step. So in a lot of these projects we get on, uh, the, the landscape is the afterthought. So there's some kind of construction that's taking place and, oh, well, you know, we'll have bare dirt and we'll just throw the seeds down and, and that'll be that. <clears throat> but again, they, they failed to uh, pay attention to the Bermuda and Johnson grass and the seed bank and, and all that. And then they're driving all over it during construction. Uh, while it's wet and they just, you know, kill the dirt and whatever. So then there's the construction phase. And a lot of times these are irrigated projects. And so um, all of the infrastructure and designs that are available, uh, you know, kind of cookie cutter for landscapes are, are all about these non-native uh, plants, traditional uh, landscape plants. And so, the, the irrigation system that you design to grow Bermuda grass uh, is wholly incompatible with the irrigation system required to establish prairie grass. <clears throat> and I can, I have some examples of that later on here, I'll show you. Uh, so installation, so <clears throat> this is important that, you know, the method that you choose uh, is matched to the requirements of the site. And so if the site requires erosion control, then you need to apply seeds with erosion control. You know, if it's a, a very large scale project, then you need a, an efficient uh, way to apply the seeds and plant them directly where they belong. So once you plant the seeds, <clears throat> they're gonna try and establish. And so again, it's back to weed management and, uh, talking about water and then maintenance. So this is after establishment. How do you maintain this for perpetuity? Uh, 
because it does require maintenance. It's just different. So most traditional landscapes uh, have the maintenance built in in perpetuity where, you know, it's mobile and go 40 weeks a year, you know, edging and all that stuff. But uh, with a with a native system, you have uh, basically two seasons and two kind of maintenance uh, processes where the biomass has to be cycled uh, to allow that season's plants access to sunlight. So historically, that was bison grazing and fire and drought. Uh, made all that happen. And so in the absence of those, you have to be the fire and you have to be the buffalo and you have to be the drought. So site selection. So here's a big commercial campus. Well, not commercial. It's a T-A-M-U-C-T. Uh, huge buildings and facilities, you know, and so where's a good fit for natives? You know, is it right up against the, you know, formal entrance to the Dealer is it out here on this trail where, you know, people will go on their lunch break or when they need to get out of the library for a minute and, and walk around. And so here, you know, out here you would have this opportunity for, uh, you know, kind of a more wild place that would blend into the natural environment and, you know, add to people's uh, sense of place and be an immunity, uh, amenity where if it were, you know, right outside the dean's office and it was grown up with tall grass and you know they they may think it's a problem so if you're assisting in in helping an institution find a place for natives you know pick the low-hanging fruit first go to where it's like it's totally makes sense so why would they want to spend all that money to mow all this area out here you know 40 weeks a year and to irrigate it when they could have uh, a native amenity you know, that is is public facing, but it's 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 in a place where it's not going to generate any kind of conflict. So <clears throat> this is an example, like in a uh, urban setting, a residential setting. Like, okay, if I'm making a plan, you know this. Uh, could somebody give me a thumbs up if y'all can see my arrow? We can see it. Okay, so in this area here, see, this is a very shady spot, right? So uh, we're actually looking north. And so, uh, you know, these are big mature pecan trees. Uh, this is in the early spring. But so this area here in the foreground is going to be you know, very, very shady. And over here, you know, you're going to have uh, a lot more access to sunlight. So you want to put your shade plants in the shade and your sun plants in the sun, you know. So, but on the back side of this house, right, it'd be all shade plants. Uh, so existing vegetation, you know, is there, look, look at all these trees here. Are any of these like something that we would want to incorporate in the landscape? And then what effect is that going to have on down the line? So, you know, if we put in uh, a mix of plants around this little oak uh, that can tolerate sun or shade, then as that tree matures, uh, there's not going to be any kind of die off that would lead to an invasion of uh, invasive plants. So you just want to look at the land and see what it's telling you. Look at what's going on around. You know, you want to work with any kind of native plant you can find in the landscape uh, that, you know, will meet your goals and objectives uh, and pick your battles. You know, you, you don't want to be fighting something that could actually be of, of benefit. You want to deal with, you know, these kind of plants. That's that's the battles that you want to have these, you know, privet and just crap. So anyway, you make uh, you make your plan, you make your design, you start to put it into practice and you, you know, reassess when let's see if I can make this thing pause. 
uh, when you run into trouble. So, you know, here that wasn't, um, it wasn't um, thought about in the plans that are in the architect's hands here about how the equipment <clears throat> was going to access the site to build the landscape. And so, you know, they basically built a road uh, which doesn't show up on the plans. And so the plans were, okay, well, they're done. Let's plant some seeds and be done with it, right? Well, there's a whole lot going on here that this environment is not the same as this one. This environment is going to require a lot of remediation and stuff that wasn't in the plan uh, in order for it to support the same life that this is. So the lines on the plan show the same vegetation in this whole area, uh, but they've... Uh, They've built counter to the success of that in this particular area. So this has to be uh, assessed and, and redesigned and, and you know, uh, remediated. But, what, you know, you don't want to you don't want to just throw your seeds on there and, and pray that it works out, you know. Uh, and so preparing a site. So I know many of you will find uh, the use of herbicides. Uh, you know, it's something that is not appropriate for you and your site. So, you know, you can uh, substitute in your mind a lawnmower and a tiller or whatever you got to do. Uh, but this is basically <clears throat> part and parcel of, of uh, the processes that, uh, you know, these areas are slated to be seeded into native grasses and wildflowers. And what you're looking at <clears throat> is a 100% uh, domination by, in this particular instance, cool season, non-native plants. And so there is no way to insert native seeds into this environment and have any kind of success because it's just cycling all of the seeds of these species. And so you have to get in there and interrupt that and provide your native plants a window of opportunity. And however you decide to get there, is is up to you but at scale uh sometimes you you spray herbicides so that you'll never have to spray that land again so in texas we have cool two seasons the cool season the warm season this is us dealing with some cool season stuff and in fact what you're looking at is in uh it's it's two and a half years in advance of applying seed And so if if this native landscape is going to be installed in, in a place where there's going to be ongoing construction, <clears throat> what you what these flags are indicating is uh, means something to the construction crew, but to me, it's like this is a noxious weed vector. So you know what's happening here is that uh, no one's paying attention to the the plants that are cycling inside of here, except for when they get too tall, and then somebody will come with a weed eater or lawnmower and they'll spread those seeds across the rest of the, the project. Uh, and then soil health and tilth. So if you have one of these roadways that, you know, if you're moving this volume of material around, you're inevitably gonna have stuff like this. Uh, they're just totally degrading the soil tilth. Uh, and so if you went to apply plant material without remediating that, you'd see a dramatic difference, you know, basically <clears throat> align where the, the tire tracks are. So, you know, be aware of those things as the project is progressing. And so all of this should be, you know, dealt with uh, in a different way besides allowing it to put on more seeds and then distributing those seeds across the site with a lawnmower or weed eater, you know. So <clears throat> a lot of these invasive species, they they are prolific seed producers. And so uh, you really have to keep that process under control while you are mining basically those seeds out of the soil for a period of time so that you can you can have a uh, a clean seed bed to apply your seeds into. So when's the best time to plant, you know? It's like it's hard to plant seeds in the mud, so you don't want to do it after a rain, but you, the best time is when your site is properly prepared in terms of these weed vectors, seed, so, the soil seed bank, and your uh, 
soil health and tilth. So here's an example of uh, irrigation infrastructure that is not designed for success. So here the objective is to uh, grow tall prairie grasses. And here we have an emitter <clears throat> that's two inches off the ground. And so what happens is as the plants grow up around that emitter, they begin to block the irrigation and put it only in this small area around the emitter. And six months later, well, that's a low res picture, geez. Uh, all this green, there's a sprinkler head right down in the middle of all that. And then all this desiccated vegetation around it where that uh, that emitter was, was unable to uh, irrigate that area. So, uh, you know, if you're working with a landscape architect or someone who's designing a, uh, irrigation system that you're going to put in uh, to your native area, you know, if you can get risers that are the pop-up kind that'll go 18 inches, that's ideal because as the, as the prairie grasses elongate and the flowers elongate, they'll tend to block the, the stream of water. So you get this really uneven distribution of water and in the areas where the water is highly concentrated, uh, you're going to have uh, an explosion of very aggressive, uh, often non-native species. So installation match uh, application method uh, to site requirements. So in this particular landscape, what you're looking at is uh, that the beds were kind of designed and, and installed first, but you can see here in the center, that even though it may look like flat ground, it's not. You can see the pooling of sediments and stuff up against this deal. So when this area gets seeded, it's gonna need a little bit of erosion control uh, to prevent the seeds from moving where they're not supposed to go. Inside of here, this is all kind of terraced, like little rain gardens. And uh, we in installed seeds and mats in those areas uh, because they were free of Bermuda grass. And we did not install the turf grass, the thunder turf, in these areas, because we needed to spend another growing season uh, treating the Bermuda grass in there. So the homeowner had to live with, you know, this look for quite a while, but they were committed to the idea of natives uh, and working from seed. So prepare the ground. There's lots of different ways to do this. Um, you know, here some soil was spread and then had a flush of weeds. And then we're harrowing those out. Uh, we had to hoe some of those. Basically, you're you're making a friable seed bed uh, that left if left unprotected will wash like this. And so that's where these blankets come back into play. They'll keep the seeds where they belong. Uh, they grow up through the blankets and those blankets then biodegrade. So there's, you know, different styles of erosion control blankets. We prefer this one that's uh, Excelsior wood fiber. They're, you know, they last about 12 months. And even though we've got water hoses all over that thing, uh, you only have to run them for about four or five minutes at, at a time because the blanket will hold moisture underneath it and provides a little bit of shade to make a really ideal environment for seeds to germinate. So you can see here, this is the same yard. And uh, over here, uh, we had to give a little bit of instant gratification. So we planted some potted uh, switchgrass from the nursery and a few other things, you know, just to have something going uh, initially. And then, then this is all uh, stuff that had grown up. So uh, from a seed mix, <clears throat> Turns out, you know, a question we get is how much seed do I plant? And, you know, we say we have all these published seeding rates in our uh, catalog, which, you know, we don't just pull those out of thin air. There's a lot of math that goes into that. And uh, one important component that we've learned after we started paying attention, very close attention to the numbers over like the last 10 years or so, we learned that, uh, you know, different species uh, act different. Some are really aggressive, you know, like Maximilian sunflower. And what we learned is, 
you know, one seed of Maximilian Sunflower is not the same thing as one seed of Black-Eyed Susan. And so when we're putting mixes together, we take into account the aggressiveness of certain species and have learned to tone those down so that the ones that are less aggressive have a chance to express themselves. But even with all of our hard work and preparation, we will always get a weed. So there's just no uh, substitute for staying on top of things, a stitch in time saves nine or whatever. So here we finally have killed off all of the Bermuda grass. That's what all these rhizomes are in the soil. And this has been tilled. And this is Blackland clay that uh, is in Sherman, Texas. And it's very difficult to get clay to till up to that kind of texture. Uh, I think we just got lucky. But that in and of itself is not a seabed. Uh, it has to be raked, and you can see all the garbage and rocks and stuff that we pulled out of there. And so what we now have here is a fine seed bed. So if you look at many of the species of native seeds, uh, they're, they're tiny. So take a, a mechanical pencil and click the lead out twice and break it off, and that's uh, like a verbena seed, for example. And so if you have big clods and rocks and stuff, all the seeds will wash down underneath those uh, and then not have enough energy to, to germinate through. You know, so hopefully you're planting a diverse mix of seeds. You know, here's a milkweed seed and a basket flower and a side oats and a wine cup, a bristle grass, you know. And when you do that, this is basically what we're talking about. So in a square foot, you're going to have differing quantities based on the type of mix that it is of different species. And so what we're trying to do is, you know, in this instance, so here we have Scorch Earth Recovery Mix, and we have Green Sprinkle Top, a species that germinates really quickly, 98% pure, where's the germ, 99% germination rate and 0% dormant. So every one of those seeds, five and a square foot, are going to sprout uh, immediately. And so since this mix is meant to stabilize soil and promote recovery, you need that initial flush in order to meet the goals and objectives. <clears throat> now, uh, when's the best time to plant? Well, if your goals and objectives are to stabilize the soil, you better, you know, be ready uh, and have the seeds in when it's time of the year for green sprinkle top to germinate. If you're forced to plant the thing in November, then you better have some cool season species in there that uh, have good germination rate. Uh, that will provide you some stability. So like Indian blanket, for example, right? That's a weird test for Indian blanket. It's usually 99. But you can see we have uh, many cool season species in here as well that have higher uh, germination rates. Lemon mint, for example, Plains coreopsis. So that's the cool thing about a diverse mix of species is that it kind of doesn't matter what time of year you plant it. All that matters is that your site is properly prepared and it's not muddy. So if you plant a diverse mix, this is kind of what it looks like. <clears throat> so here we're talking about uh, establishment phase and weed management. All right, where's the, who can point to the weeds in the in this picture? But this is the stage at which you have to begin to uh, look at that and get a plan of, of action together and identify things uh, and nip them in the bud before they get out of hand. <clears throat> Only thing that someone would call a weed in this photo uh, is this thistle over here and this buffalo burr, which is actually a native plant that I wouldn't really mess with. And it's going to fade over time and it's good for the bumblebees. So. But what you want to be looking for here is like runners of Bermuda, sprigs of Johnson grass, you know, 
KR blue stem, things that are going to be competitive with this standard native grass. This is actually, uh, this area is very well on its way to success. So water talk. So we talked about loving things to death. So here, all these fluorotic plants are um, basically in an inch of rich topsoil on top of hard packed caliche uh, and being irrigated uh, five or six times a day in the cool season. So, you know, in excess of six inches a month or something of, of irrigation and they the, the site doesn't drain well. And so these plants are basically drowning. But you notice here in the center, there's this one plant that has the right green coloration. And then here in the foreground, here's another plant that is like loving life. Uh, so that's a, that's a bastard cabbage. And this one in here is a armadillo bird clover. So if this type of management persists for much longer, uh, all this native stuff that's germinated is going to die. It's all like black eyed Susans and lemon mints and Indian blankets and good stuff. But they're trying to kill it by loving it to death. See, look at that soil profile. So those those wildflowers are like upland species. They're upland wildflowers. And this kind of soil profile is what you would grow like cardinal flower or obedient plant or something like that. And that's that's being done by human beings. But you can see how rich the soil is. They got earthworms in it. So there's potential. Anyway, you know, a few weeks go by or whatever and this stuff just gets out of hand. Warmer weather comes and, you know, this is what, what happens. So when you're applying water, you know, you got to understand native plants like a certain regimen uh, in order to initiate germination. So they like it wet for three or four weeks. And then as they sprout, uh, that there's more time in between water events, but that you water for longer duration. So that's where these uh, irrigation blankets, I mean, that uh, erosion blankets have a, a positive impact on your irrigation. So you can get away with a lot less water uh, and they help stabilize the environment. So here we are in July 20th, 100 degrees. After a week, the thunder turf starts to sprout. That's the blue grama that's in there. After 16 days, and you can see even then there's still some weeds after we worked on it for that long. So you have to go out there and get those. Uh, in 35 days in the heat of summer. But you have to understand, okay, the buffalo grass and blue grama are high plain species that, uh, you know, are, are synced with the monsoons. And so that's the time of year where they will be the most actively growing. Versus like if you seeded them in early March and it's cool, you know, it may take uh, 70 days or 90 days for it to reach this level of maturity. But if you want this, you have to learn to live with this. And so this is where I'm talking about maintenance and biomass cycling. So historically, you would have bison come in and eat all that vegetation, or you'd have it burn up. So in a native landscape, uh, that all has to be cycled. And if you don't, you just wind up growing trees. Trees grow out of it because there's no disturbance. And so on a, you know, a place that gets 50 inches of rainfall a year, you might have to do this twice. Out here in the hill country, you know, you may do it once a year or you may do it once every three years. Just depends on when it rains, you know, and you get that flush of the biomass. So you need a plan to deal with that. And, uh, you know, you can make a lot of good compost. Uh, you know, at scale, you can bale that off, make bales or burn it or shred it. Lots of different ways to go about that, but that has to be part of the process. So, you know, back to the establishment, you know, you can't 
you can't let stuff get out of hand. Otherwise, it just requires this tremendous effort and somebody with plant ID skills to be able to go in there and sort it out. And there are very few of those folks on the planet. I'm sure NIPSOC uh, are among them, but it's still a physical task when you let those plants get to that size. And when you're having to deal with it at scale, you know, follow the mouse. That's all bastard cabbage that had to be hand removed to save this landscape all the way around. So on this project, we got to turn the water off um, and let us get the weeds out. We put some more seed in just where we had disturbed and got their water cycle correct. And then two months later, just by treating the plants the way they want to be treated, uh, changing the design, this is what they got. Now you'll notice there's still a ton of bare ground. It's all cracked open and dry, but look at the look at how happy those plants are. Look at the color of the leaves, it's verdant green. <clears throat> anyway, these are providing shade for the establishing grasses that are underneath there. And the reason that this looks the way it does is because it was seeded in November, okay? So it really favored the cool season plants. Right, like who wouldn't want that? Anyway, this was the same seed mix on the same property, but this was installed the previous like March. And so you can see, so there's all blue bonnets basically uh, and wildflowers is the green coloration. And it's all little blue stem that has, you know, had a whole year to mature and then was cut back in the fall to make room for the wildflowers to grow. So it's the same seed mix uh, in, the, in the same year. It was seeded in the same year, just, you know, months apart. So when's the best time to plant? Well, kind of, if you need the grass to stabilize your bank, maybe you ought to, look at doing it in the growing season for grass. Anyway, this is not maintenance. This is not an example of maintenance. So, you know, this was six years ago or something. I guarantee you there's not a native plant left on that particular project. It's all over with Bermuda grass. And uh, taking a weed eater and, and, you know, digging up some dirt is the Bermuda grass doesn't care, you know. And so why would... If, if your goal, and, and then here they just leave the Johnson grass. So if your goals and objectives are to have native plants, why in the world would you plant Bermuda grass sod unimpeded adjacent to your, your planting area? And the same thing here. It's like, hey, George, can you come uh, install a prairie for us on either side here? And we've here we've put this buffalo grass, you know, I mean not buffalo grass, Bermuda grass in here. Uh, and oh, by the way, it's going to be you know four weeks before the site's ready for you to plant. So in the four weeks, you know, uh, Bermuda's all over the place. So it's like, what's the point? You know, don't. That's not a good fit for native plants when the designers are going to do something like that. And there is no substitute for head, heart, and hands. You know, you got to love it, and you got to get out there and do it. Uh, and really, it's, you know, the establishment phase is where it's the toughest. And so all those 40 weeks a year of mow, blow, and go landscape maintenance all kind of front-loaded into a, a native planting. And uh, if you're going to be doing it in public-facing spaces, you know, you really have to help with the interpretive side of things to get the community um, where they'll be accepting of it. And eventually what happens is, is that uh, they, the public uh, loves it and they take ownership in it. And uh, especially if you have this kind of uh, interpretive thing, you know, and offer people the, the opportunity to get on like iNaturalist and make observations here and you know, the locals 
just like take ownership of it. And then anytime like a piece of construction equipment or something shows up, they're throwing fits, trying to take care of their prairie, you know, and uh, I just can't understate uh, or overstate how important uh, this kind of signage is. And of course, if you ever have an opportunity to make something a way station, you should, that helps. But, you know, native landscapes, uh, when you're working with seed, are an entirely different thing than when you put in, you know, three flats of plants and mulch around them. You know, these are living, breathing things where, you know, nature's kind of free to roam. And, you know, the power of seeds is just undeniable uh, once you start watching these things. So I think that uh, working with seeds in landscapes really facilitates a much higher level of engagement uh, with people that are stewarding them, you know, because they're not static and they're always changing. They always look different. And so that's kind of the, to me, the attractiveness to it. It's like a, you know, the opportunity and a challenge. So I anyway, uh, will take some questions on that part of the deal. And uh, I don't even know how long I went. Was that 45 minutes? So I need to zip through the other one. Unless you're on the right screen. Yeah, I see you. So first question, George. first question, I planted a pocket prairie three years ago, it's produced well. Several native wildflowers. I'm hoping that with maturity, it will increase in diversity. I'm wondering if a high mow in the autumn or not, Sarah. Sarah, so, you know, it really, if you're uh, wanting diversity, uh, diversity is a product of disturbance. And so uh, if you have these grasses, and it kind of depends on which ones they are, uh, likely it's going to be kind of dominated by uh, our early successional mid-height grasses. So, you know, side oaks grama and cane blue stem and bristle grass and uh, sprangle top, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, that takes a while to shift over to, you know, your Indian grass and, and that kind of thing. It could be five, six, seven years. Uh, and so uh, if you're wanting to see like more broadleaf plants established, uh, more wildflowers in the spring, then uh, that's really kind of like a late summer uh, cut on the grass and a raking to kind of open up and expose some soil in between those grasses. You know, if you're if you're if you're wanting to see more uh, like big blue stem and Indian grass and switchgrass, you know, then it's kind of, uh, you want to be on those things in the <clears throat> early summer to slow down some of the seed production of the sprinkle top and side oats and stuff like that. Cause they're, they're going to be making seed all summer long. Okay. And so you, you kind of suppress those and then leave it alone in the fall. And that's when your dominant grasses will, will come. Well, I did. I did spend nearly eighteen months preparing the soil, so I was a good girl. <laughs> Pressed the weeds with mulch, which I then took to, took off, and then had it air tilled, so that it was all loosened. It's really a savanna more than a pocket, a prairie. So I've got shade, so, so shade so grasses and shade wildflowers as well. It, in many places in Texas, um, the prairies kind of uh, change into savannas, especially like when you get uh, east of I-35. And so, uh, you know, black so prairies. Wim Sorry, go ahead. I'm in Wimberley. Uh -huh. So Wimberley, <clears throat> you'll have a similar kind of effect with the giant oak trees. Yeah. You know, I think... Uh, you know, historically, there would have been less of a oak population just due to the, you know, more abundance of fire. And so, you know, those oak trees would have been there, but the, they would have been suppressed on the top. Anyway, you can go look at, uh, there's a whole thing called the Ecological Site Description System. You can find your property on the uh, NRCS 
soil web soil survey and then you can navigate to your uh, ecological site and there are many instances where they talk about savannas uh, in the grasslands of Texas and uh, believe it or not little blue stem is actually quite shade tolerant so in many of those savannas that's dominated by by little blue stem I have lots of that <laughs> so I'm doing good but thank okay. you so in maintenance in maintenance mode how do I channel my inner bison I emo how often how short okay uh Dory these this is uh again back to your goals and objectives so you know the the bison grazing was kind of infrequent you know in Texas and it was it was often followed by fire and it was a selected okay so um that a selective disturbance really kind of promotes diversity because there has to and you know with the pawing and the the wallowing and all that stuff that creates an opportunity for the annual plants to to express themselves and to try and heal back so you think about the grassland like your skin <clears throat> and the wildflowers like the blood and so you have to cut your skin to get the blood that's kind of how it works and so um you know the, the if you're just mowing the tops off and laying all that mulch down uh over the bare soil you're you're not going to get uh, an an expression of annual wildflowers as as uh, you know profuse as you would if all of that biomass was changed into manure. <laughs> okay, me uh, no, that's not necessarily the case. So we are very particular about um, where our plant materials come from and where they go, but uh, take a Take a species like black-eyed Susan, for example. If you look at its distribution map, it'll be from Oregon to Maine to California to Florida. So our genetics are going to come from Texas, and you know they're going to do fine in any part of Texas. You know what we what we don't like doing is you know sending our uh, say our Gulf states a little blue stem. Uh, over to western New Mexico up in the mountains and say, yeah, that's appropriate, you know. So when we make Blackland Prairie Mix, we try to use the grass components from as close to the Blackland Prairie region that we can. But sometimes, you know, like we're growing them here out in the hill country. So we might have collected our genetics uh, from mul a multitude of places uh, we grow them here in Junction, but they're, you know, much more likely to survive in the Blackland Prairie than, say, if we went to, you know, Canada and got some stuff from up there. So it never hurts to ask, you know, what's what. Uh, if you look at our labeling, like I showed the slide of our seed mix, all those different lots of seed uh, have lot numbers, and those lot numbers contain information about its origin. And our our staff is happy to provide you with that information. Does that answer that one? Yes, thanks, George. And, yeah, and in general, in those in those uh, those ecosystem in a bag mixes, basically, what we're what we're doing there uh, with those is that we'll we'll harvest a prey remnant and then spice it up with stuff that we grow on the farm. The so when we go out and and I'll show a slide here on uh, in a second about. When we're doing large scale harvesting prairie remnants, it's usually in the fall. And so there's not a lot of Indian blanket or you know whatever left over that late into the season. So we'll just add that back in there because it's supposed to be part of the uh, part of the mix. Thanks, George. I can I ask one more question about sure. the genetic? So uh, I have a friend who managed the remnant prairies in North Texas here. So we were discussing like uh, on certain locations uh, for restoration, is it good to mix with the, the seed mix? No, not seed mix, specific maybe, let's talk about Indian blanket. Maybe it's coming from Native American seeds. When I do the restoration, it's good to have the combined genetics. Like, so we can increase the, the plant, how do you say, the resilience? Yes, I would say so. Uh, you know, the more genetic diversity, the better. But, you know, I think there are 
lines that you can cross, you know, where, especially if something's been selectively bred, right? And it's had, it's, you know, it's gone through multiple generations at a grower where they're, they're selectively, you know, looking for specific characteristics of that plant. You know, I, I think, uh, think I, I have a, I mean, I did a whole talk on this at uh, one a Nipsot symposium in Austin. And if, if y'all are curious about, you know, the kinds of things that are going on in the seed industry with regard to that, please uh, feel free to contact me uh, outside of this. I think in general, if you can have uh, seeds from, you know, kind of different populations uh, in Texas and, you know, uh, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arkansas, just in your general region, that nature will work it out, but it's good to kind of allow that genetic thing to uh, be unbottlenecked. Thank you. Okay, what's the best way to eliminate invasive plants like KR before preparing and planting your seed without using chemicals? Terry, Terry, KR blue stem. Uh, basically, you have to farm that land for two growing seasons. And what I mean is that uh, you'll you'll uh, just you know plow it up, and basically, if you have enough soil, you have to flip it over and bury the seed bank. Uh, and then plant a cover crop uh, in the cool season and warm season uh, in order to be sure that you you sterilize the seed bank. And if you don't have enough soil to do that, uh, then it's uh, it's going to be a little bit longer. But you have to you have to kill the mother plants, uh, and then you have to deal with the seed bank. And if you're on thin, rocky soils in the hill country, you know, you better be putting uh, cover crops down uh, in order to prevent your soil from washing away. But that's kind of a double-edged sword because the cover crops are suppressive in and of themselves. And so you may think you got it whooped until you uh, put your seed out there. But often what will happen is you'll, you'll do your best and you won't be able to get everyone you know, plant native seed, and it'll come up in a some kind of recombinant state. And it's either you go out there with a hoe and uh, dig up the KR when you find it, or you light it on fire in August and have a drought, uh, and that'll wipe out 95% of the KR blue stem. So it's a huge challenge. We've been successful on a few projects working it that way. Um, one is the Commons Ford Metropolitan Park that uh, Travis Audubon has field days out there. If y'all like to see birds, you ought to go holler at them and go check that out. It's really cool. It's a 40 acre prairie restoration that was KR blue stem, Bermuda grass, and Johnson grass. We did use chemicals. We did use chemicals on that, but we we buried the seed bank. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, I'm trying to replace St. Augustine grass in Houston. Is there a turfish seed appropriate to plant, Tina? It depends, Tina. Uh, there are, we do have some folks that have been successful with the buffalo grass over there, uh, but you really need kind of a high spot that drains well. And, uh, you know, most oftentimes the yards over there are real shady. And uh, there's really just not uh, a good grass option. But there are plants like frog fruit and horse herb. Uh, and think if there's any other native ground covers that you can mow that act grassish. But what I tell folks is like, man, just you know, if you have to keep some lawn to go play croquet on or whatever, just figure out how to reduce it in size and make some planter beds and do something much more interesting with the rest of it. There's a, a friend of ours named Jaime Gonzalez. He works for the Nature Conservancy. Uh, he used to work at the Katy Prairie Conservancy. And what he does in his yard, he calls it the Hatton Springs Prairie. And he just like dug some holes here and yonder uh, and seeded it with wildflowers. And they, you know, the wildflowers come up and they spread year after year. Uh, and then when they're done, 
in July, he'll just mow them down and have St. Augustine grass or whatever. But at least you're, you know, you're doing something besides just the same old, same old. All right, so how much how much deeper into the rabbit hole do y'all want to go? Can I get somebody to give me a time limit? Um gosh, I'm enjoying it. <laughs> I mean, I would think uh certainly till eight o'clock. I don't know what you can you know, if 15 minutes on the seed collecting aspect is enough but if, if you need half an hour and want to go till 8 15 i'm happy uh with that um that's one vote okay let me get through this thing here okay so you asked laura asked for some bullet points on seed collecting so this is a presentation i've given uh, a few times and it kind of shows the process of how we we go about collecting seed um This is always the first step. So you can see that. Don't, don't forget to share your screen, George. We're not seeing your presentation. Did I not share? Okay, here, let me get back to this. I took it away from you, so you have to go back to it. Okay. Sure. Let's try this again. Okay. What I was going to say is that, uh, you know, children mimic those that are around them. And what Fisher's doing there is he's, he's mimicking the adults that are around him. And we're all checking the seeds to make sure that they have fill in them. So that's like, that's the most important thing is like, don't collect empty seeds. So how do you know how not to do that? Well, it takes a lot of practice. Uh, but anyway, in general, this is how Native American seed uh, operates at scale on a prairie harvest. That is a giant combine and a giant header. It's like flying a jumbo jet. Uh, for me personally, it's like some of the most satisfying work I get to do. Here's what it looks like. Okay, so that's a pristine uh, prairie remnant in the sandy soils in Colorado County. And what this machine is doing is just stripping seeds off the seed stalk. So we're not cutting anything. You see where it's been and where it hadn't up against the road. You see all the fuzzy white cottony seeds of the little blue stem and then that big swath of darker red. That's where the machine has passed. It has these uh, army of fingers on it. It's 30 feet wide. And if you think about each one of those fingers as the finger on a hand, how many hands is that? So <clears throat> even an army of volunteers just cannot, you know, match the scale of what this machine can do. But whenever you're collecting seed, you got to have help. You always want to go with somebody else, you know, especially if you're out in nature, there's all kinds of things. And uh, even at that, you always want a second set of eyes to help, you know, be sure that you got your plant ID correct. That's one of the big deals. If you're going to be sharing seeds with people, uh, you don't want to share a misidentified uh, species with someone. Like we've been burned like that before. Oh yeah, I got larkspur growing all over my yard. I'll send you some. Okay, well that's rocket lark larkspur and not not the one that we want. You know. So uh, 
anyway, we gather up all the material and like, if y'all go hand collecting, you'll know what I'm talking about, that you never wind up with pure seeds in your bag. You got to deal with it. Yeah, we'll do this for a month or two at a time in the fall, during rainy years, try it all later. But that's just the power of seed, you know. It's a thousand acres of prairie in that trailer. But it's not all fun and games, and uh, that's why you always want to uh, bring a friend. You never know. You know, there could be a rattlesnake or something, so you want to be out there by yourself. Got to do some quality control. Uh, and so that seed is usually not dry when we get it. Uh, most seed is not dry when we get it. And uh, if it truly is dry, it's probably on the ground. And so... You don't want to ever store your seed until it's had an appropriate amount of time to dry out. And that way it'll become stable. So we force air through the bottom of these old peanut trailers and blow it through the harvest to, to dry it out. Uh, and basically here we can sort out contaminants and uh, separate different species. Uh, but main thing is, is that we're taking the lightweight stuff off. And so when you go to harvest wild plants, uh, there's going to be 50% 50, 50 or more of the seeds that are wholly empty. Okay. So at Native American Seed, we uh, take those off there and send it off to a laboratory to get verified uh, results that show us what it is exactly that we have. So anyway, how do you know when it's time to go get them? So here, you know, there are, I'd say 80 to 90% of the plants that we work with are indeterminate. So if any of y'all are gardeners, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But here you can see uh, on this uh, salvia farinacea that you have blooms and then you have seed pods where seeds are ripe. And uh, when you're using a big mechanical process like the one I just showed you, how do you know when it's time to, to gather all that stuff up? So uh, y'all's scenario is going to be different. Um, you know, y'all are going to be collecting by hand. Maybe you have some, you know, ways that you cut the plants and, and let them dry and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I, I should mention that I believe NIPSOT has published guidelines about uh, the ethical way to harvest seeds from native populations. And so I'm guessing that a NIPSOT person can put that link in the chat uh, on y'all's, I think it's on the state website. Uh, so, you know, if if there's only, you know, eight seed pods here that have right viable seeds in them, it'd be unethical to cut all those potential seeds off those plants just for the eight that are ready. You know, so you want to be paying close attention to that and you say, okay, well, how do I know when a seed is ready? Uh, these salvias are kind of notorious for it. Uh, but you can see, so on the right-hand side, that's a caryopsis. And what's in, inside of there is called the germplasm. And so we always are checking seeds by crushing them uh, in between our thumbnails to see if there's either an oil stain that shows up or if it's a bigger seed. What state is this germplasm in? And we call that <clears throat> dough. Okay, and it looks like you popped a big old zit or whatever. Uh, but the the firmer that dough is, and the darker the color of the uh, the husk or the the seed coat is, the more likely that seed is to to be mature. Now, even though that one's light colored and it's in that state, if you were to harvest that seed and give it time to cure, it would, and it would be a viable seed. So, you know, most oftentimes folks are going and collecting like when there's not a single bloom left and it's, you know, three months out of season and, oh, look, there's some, you know, seeds left on this plant. They're left on that plant for a reason. They're empty. You know, in general, uh, most of these plants uh, 
preferred, you know, adapted method of distribution uh, requires them to drop the seeds almost as soon as they're ready. There are very few uh, that would benefit from holding seed onto the onto the stalks, and you'll find most of those to be like uh, stickery plants. You know, that are going to be stuck to a, a bison and moved around that way. You know, a lot of these salvias they drop their seed in close proximity. You know, and and other annual wildflowers will do the same thing. And then there's others that are windborne, like what advantage is there to a plant that has windborne seeds uh, to hold those close to the stalk? So if you're going to pick Indian grass and it's December and there's, you know, one plant left that has a, a seed head on it, I can guarantee you that 100% of those seeds are empty. They never formed the appropriate structures or weights to uh, uh, remove themselves from the plant. Are y'all seeing this dumb zoom bar? On my screen, this thing. Let me move this out of the way. <laughs> no, we don't see it. Okay, so here you can see uh, you know, what is often the case is that seeds are like food. Uh, they're the they're the foundational, you know, food source in the ecosystem, and uh, there's all kinds of critters that'll get in them and chew holes in them and stuff. So you know, even though it looks like there's uh, two, four, six good seeds there, there may only be three. And that's where the process that we run stuff through over here comes into play is that we have machines that can separate things out based on their specific gravity and weight. And so and we go ahead and take care of that and knock those three empty seeds out. So you may think that you're giving somebody a hundred seeds, but you don't really know unless you, you know, cleaned them and tested them. And so a lot of times that's that's a big thing I hear from people is like, man, these plants are so hard to grow. I collected my seed and like nothing happened, you know. It's like, well, there's a little bit more that goes into it than just going and picking structures off of a plant. But again, here's another example. A lot of stuff in the aster family will do this same thing where it's indeterminate. So this mist flower, you know, and look, there's, you know, ripe seeds and, and seed heads that have already shattered and blooms all on the plant. And the plant just keeps doing this over and over and over and over again. So, you know, how you know when to go cut off uh, and thresh it in a combine or whatever. It makes our lives hell over here at Native American Seed. But, you know, if you understand this, then you'll understand why you pick up a packet of seed and it's five bucks or whatever. You know, you can kind of understand where we're coming from is that it's a tremendous amount of uh, work and a lifetime or more, you know, multiple lifetimes of experience in order to put a living thing that small into the palm of your hands, you know, on demand. So milkweeds, uh, you know, they're tough. They're like, like I was telling you, what, what reason would a milkweed plant have to hold on to its seeds once they're ready? You know, they want, they, and so that's what happens is man, you like blink and they just drop all their seed on you. And so how do you know when's the right time to go get them? And if you don't know, then you might wind up putting baggies on them so that, you know, you get them all or whatever. You know, again, there's, you know, windborne seed and there's a closed pod. It's like, it's just, it's tough, you know. You blink and that's what happens, you know. It gets to be 100 degrees in the afternoon and a seed pod that wasn't even open yet in the morning does that. What we found on milkweeds is if they look about like that, then you're good to go. Okay, another thing is with these berries <clears throat> and fruits and akines, I don't know what they call them, but uh, anything that's got a fleshy seed coat on there, you know, that's, you can't just store a seed like that. You, you have to clean it up and uh, dry it out in order to store it. Then you have your capsules, you know, that have the, there's a million and one seeds in each capsule. And if you blink, the capsule falls off, you know, so it's very, very, this is cardinal flowers, very tricky to know when to pick the capsules. And we usually get them a little green and let them dry out and they'll, they'll open up and drop all their seeds. Primroses are like that. You know, then you have other plant structures how do you know, you know? 
anyway, in general, like for, for dealing with the fleshy stuff, we'll wash it down and dry it out in the sun. We're fortunate in Junction to have a lot of sun. So those were the seeds that have been washed. So now we're drying them for storage. Okay, so, you know, you would harvest the seed on the left, but what do you think? Would you harvest the seed on the right? You know, you're too late here. It's already on the ground. There might not be any seed left in those black-eyed Susan heads. But if you're seeing this on the ground, you might ought to check because you probably could still get some. But says so what they'll do. They'll just blow around in the wind and drop all their seeds out of the seed heads and the seed head will be sitting there on the stalk and then here you come, you know, a month late and spend all your day picking those uh, seed heads and there's nothing in them. There's no advantage to that plant to leaving the seeds in the seed head. You know, how about here? There's an 80% chance of 60 mile an hour winds tonight and thunderstorms in excess of two inches. Are you gonna are you gonna take the risk and go cut it or you're gonna let it sit? You know, these are the kinds of decisions that we have to make all growing season long. You know, you're on a trip to a special place and this is, you know. Your only your only day to collect seed, and this is your only opportunity. You know, are you going to take it or not? Well, if it, the basket flower looks like the the heads on the left, then yes, you would collect those. But you can see some of these; they're all closed up, and if you open them up, they have white seeds in them that are real milky on the inside, and those won't cure. So you don't want to get those. So we've had to, you know, figure out all manner of ways to deal with this. This method works pretty good on perennial wine cups that grow real low to the ground. They shed seed daily during the growing season, and we'll go and pick it up every 10 days. You know, grasses are tough. <clears throat> so on grasses, if you see structures like on the left, that's pollen. Uh, those are those are not ready. <clears throat> on the right, what you see is they hadn't even the little blue stem hadn't even opened up to bloom. And if you're not sure, you can take each individual uh, seed apart and see if you can find uh, a grain inside of it. It's very hard when the wind's blowing 20 miles an hour and you're out in the field. You know, you got to have, have a, a quiet, safe space to do it in. But, you know, nature will give you clues. So if you see birds working something over, then good likelihood that there's something to be had there. You know, but again... These are immature. It's immature brown seed past phallum on the left and mature brown seed past phallum on the right. You see the pollen structures on the flower on the left. And you see that black <clears throat> marking on the fingers. That's that's from the pollen of that grass. Again, you can you can look to nature for clues, you know. So the these seed eating birds, if they're working, if you watch them and they're working over a certain species, uh, then there's there's probably some good seeds to be had out there. And the harvester ants, if you're ever around where they are, if you watch what they're working, or you can see what they're carrying in and out of their nest, and those are mature seeds, and so those would be the ones that uh, you know you should have collected yesterday. And then as far as storing your seeds, uh, if you're comfy, they're comfy. You just don't want big fluctuations in humidity and temperature. So we recommend just keeping them inside. Like how we used to, our newer house is a lot bigger than this. And then just for fun, this is how you plant them. This particular place, we just mowed short and went and drilled in a bunch of wildflowers at three-eighths of an inch with a no-till drill. 
just for some native species diversification and I'm not going to turn out to be a, a restoration because uh you know you have exotic grasses in there too but anyway any any questions on uh seed collection i'll go ahead and unshare or any other <clears throat> questions in general about native american seed or how we can help you or Got a couple of we got a link here um posted online from rachel and then um laura sent this uh collection policy from native plant society and she's going to send that out at the end of the meeting here as well yeah i think so i think can you can you scroll back up <clears throat> the, the yeah. last sentence the last sentence on that page was something i didn't mention but it's it's uh, it's to be taken uh, seriously. So, you know, your actions when you're dealing with rare and endangered species like have consequences, and you know we may not know what all those are. So, you know, it, and it, you don't want to be wasteful in any way. The rarer the plant, you know, your objective should be to collect that plant to propagate it and increase its population. You know, for its critical habitat. And not for you know some other selfish reason, but you you know you don't want to like the example I gave with the mealy blue sage. You don't want to take eight seeds to destroy eight hundred. You know you want to take uh, what you can without endangering those populations. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, Carolyn, it's interesting what happens. Uh, native plants, while well adapted here, uh, don't give you the same thing year in and year out uh, seed wise. So what we've seen this year uh, is the, the plants that uh, we harvested early on, the seeds that we harvested early on in the year, uh, had good yields and good fill because we had all the spring rain. But a lot of the crops that come ready in the summer just got blowtorched. And so, you know, it's kind of hit or miss on, you know, availability. So, you know, like while we made it last year, we might have made, you know, X number of thousands of pounds of uh, basket flour. This year, we may only have 500, you know. But that's just the nature of our work. And uh, it's always something that's farming, you know, half of what we do can fail any given year, you know, uh, and so, you know, that's over the years to navigate that we've kind of gone to this model of uh, making regional seed mixes so that, uh, you know, people don't get hung up on having, you know, this one individual thing here and that one individual thing there. And it's, that's kind of how we work out the availability, but beyond the, but beyond the, uh, how does it affect our, our work like you know in, in terms of production availability it's uh it's demoralizing to have to work in that kind of environment when it's so hot and so brutal and you know we're trying our darndest to keep these plants happy and productive and it's just like it doesn't matter it just doesn't it just doesn't matter you know and it's it's tough because so much of the population in this country can't get past the BS to see what's really going on, that the world is on fire, you know, and what are we doing, you know? <clears> okay, <throat> hey, Laura, yes, any and all native plants that, uh, you know, fit well in a landscape that we're not currently offering or that we're offering in very small quantities, uh, we would love that. And you know, I personally, you know, find a lot of enjoyment in taking stuff like that and putting it into a greenhouse setting and multiplying it out. You know, we've pretty much exhausted most of the, you know, real easy to grow plants in terms of like, you know, yeah, we have them by the pound or whatever, you know. If you look at our conservancy sections, like 
you know, those are plants that uh, if you take a handful of seeds and go seed them out in a row, you'll get two plants in a hundred feet. And, uh, but those are the ones that everybody's asking for now, you know, because they're rare and different or whatever. So th those are the ones that I like to work with. Uh, so you can look at our conservancy section, but, uh, you know, just in general, anything that's uh, beautiful or has a, has a special pollinator relationship or a special bird relationship, a plant that, that uh, is iconic, you know, and tells a story. Uh, just, and, you know, we bank stuff here. So, you know, if, if I get, you know, a handful of Zazotis milkweed this year and a handful next year and a handful the next year, well, now I have something to work with, you know, so uh, I know the milkweed's been real popular. Uh, and we have plenty of, of, uh, green and antelope horns we don't have a lot of uh, uh and the butterfly weed we have plenty of that we don't we don't have a lot of the zazotis or the wand or the texas milkweeds uh you know and then uh, warm season annual wildflowers is another thing that uh, a lot of folks aren't paying a lot of attention to but so we have like uh, you know sleepy daisy and tohoka daisy uh and a Ringo, but, uh, you know, I'm looking for other plants that kind of fill that summer void for pollinators. So there's like the, the Palafoxias are real good ones. And uh, I don't know off the top of my head, but, you know, any kind of warm season annual plant that's productive. The Calpin Daisy, we have that. Uh, you know, just things that like we're not, that's not on our radar. That is, that may be in y'all's, uh, chapters or in your you know travels and discussions uh, and of course like uh, you know regional regional ecotypes <clears throat> of things that we're already doing I have no problem throwing a handful of whatever you got into our next year's planting just to kind of spice up the the diversity you know and yes they can be brought to New Braunfels Okay, well, thank you. Um, looks like, uh, of course, lots of um, thank yous for a great presentation and for all the work that Native American Seed does. Um, and yeah, it is it is agriculture. So you're out there dealing with the elements uh, every day. So it, I know it's challenging and we all appreciate it. And um, that was just so very interesting. The Planting for success, thinking about the end result of success is a good way to start. That's a good way to start. So yeah, thank people, you very much for your time. I, I want to say a big thank you to uh, Native Plant Society, uh, who's always been a great supporter of the work that we do. We could not do it without uh, you folks. And also to any of you who are uh, in the Master Naturalist program, and or yeah. Autumn, yeah. all of you people uh, make our life possible and we appreciate it. Right. Is that new catalog out? It will hit your mailbox this weekend. All right. That's something to look forward to. And all right. You, well, thank you. you. Yeah. And if you're not on the list, you can yeah. go to www.seedsource.com and request one or view a digital version. And that was wonderful seeing all those great pictures of Fisher. What a <laughs> what a magical childhood he's having. That's really those are lucky, beautiful pictures. So luckiest, luckiest so, kid in the planet for sure. Oh, absolutely. Well, thank you again, George. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And um, definitely, we encourage you to join and become a member if you haven't. NPSOT.org uh, and. Um, and then we have our own Hill Country website and Facebook pages as well. So reach out to us. Uh, we'd love to get to know you and help you if we can. Um, and thank you again for coming tonight. Everybody try and stay cool and 